work up if your center um, has this uh, scan it is so well and good and uh, it is based on which principle can somebody tell which principle Waterberg effect. oh very good so and he got Nobel Prize in 1931 I think. 1931 yes. physicist, yes. in, physicist in uh, uh, Germany who said that uh, cancer cells depend exclusively on glucose for as energy substrate and uh, the cancer cells undergo a special type of treatment of glucose so one glucose molecule is converted to lactic acid lactate along with four atps four atps only four atps are generated with the lactic acid it the lactic acid does not progress further and full oxidative carboxylation decarboxylation converting glucose into carbon dioxide and h2 is does not happen and only four atps are created with lactic acid so this is called even in presence of oxygen even presence of oxygen. in uh, in normal person you and me if we say have hemorrhagic shock and uh, we will have lactic acid formed due to anaerobic glycolysis Right, because at cellular level oxygen is not reaching. But here, oxygen reaching the cell, in spite of that, glucose is converted to lactate. So this is called aerobic lactic acidosis, aerobic lactic glycolysis. So, um, so PET scan is based on that. You attach um, fluorine 18, um, isotope of fluorine with glucose, deoxyglucose, and give it intravenously, and then scan the whole body. Tumor cells, depending exclusively on glucose molecule for energy substrate, they will take more of it and demonstrate the metastatic foci. Okay, so that's about uh, what are the indications for new adjunct chemotherapy? Basically, locally advanced breast carcinoma T3, T4. So you assess. So you assess the patient and operate metastatic workup, confirm the histology, type and grade of histology. We are talking of invasive locally advanced breast carcinoma. Okay. If it is in situ breast carcinoma, regardless of the size, regardless of the size, whether it is 10 centimeter or 20 centimeter, even football size in situ breast carcinoma has only one treatment, that is surgery, full mastectomy. There's no role of preoperative chemotherapy or hormone therapy in in situ tumor. In situ means a very well differentiated tumor. Basin membrane is intact. There is no metastasis. So such slowly growing neoplasms do not regress with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy works mostly on the rapidly dividing cells which are undergoing mitosis at a very fast rate. So the other name for chemotherapy is antimitotic agents. So they are obviously suppressing some stage of cell cycle, the mitosis, whether it is S phase or M phase or G1 phase, G2 phase and so on. Okay. So if cells are growing very slowly, their cell cycle time, doubling time is very slow, as is the case in, in situ neoplasms. Therefore, these cells will not get controlled. So in situ, so you have to have the invasion in in the tumor, then only offer preoperative chemotherapy. So the next step would be metastatic workup. This again should be done prior to commencing any systemic therapy. Why? Suppose there were small nodules in the lungs or liver or bones, and you offer two courses of chemotherapy, they may regress completely. Demonstrate a very good uh, response to chemotherapy. So you will never know about the metastatic status unless you have done a metastatic workup on day zero okay and then only 
plan new adjunct chemotherapy in consultation with oncologist so the oncology team who offer systemic chemotherapy hormone therapy as well as radiotherapy they should all be consulted in the decision making process and you should have consultation with your pathologist who is evaluating the breast pathology for you and also the radiologist who are doing mammogram and ultrasound and breast imaging so it should be a joint multidisciplinary team approach each patient should be assessed carefully for the safety and effectiveness and the type of systemic chemotherapy you are going to offer so assess there and after each cycle which is usually three weekly cycles so assess their clinical response measure the lump with the vernier caliper and then if patient has partial response what is the definition of partial response on racist criteria r e c i s t partial response more, is more than 30% regression of largest uh, dimension okay meaning the largest dimension largest so, so the current racist criteria requires you to measure the longest or largest dimension only why earlier you know they were taking length and breadth and then taking a product of it so length into breadth so a, a is the length b is the width so a into b was taken and if you have two lumps a into b and then uh, some total plus c into d if there are two lumps and then that product or the sum of the products was taken as initial size later on we used to calculate whether there is 30% regression in the product but that was confusing and we were assuming that length into breadth it's all homogeneous spherical mass which is not the case it's a irregular haphazardly growing mass so now they said that it is just to measure the longest dimension and if there is more than 30% regression in the largest dimension you can assume that cells most of the cells are chemo sensitive and there is a fair chance that if you continue all four more cycles we assess this at the end of two cycles three weeks after the second cycle okay because cells are the chemotherapy works fairly rapidly but it still takes about two weeks to demonstrate full tumor cell kill so after three weeks from the second course then the lady will come and you measure the size and if it is more than 30% you assume that um, she will respond and there's a fair chance that after six cycles the entire tumor will vanish okay so partial or complete response now the question would be if a lady is desirous of best preservation how would you know where the primary tumor was okay so some people just put a you know they put a scar at the biopsy site and then put a some suture which will cause some scarring of the skin and they will know that even if the tumor has regressed completely okay this is without putting any clip but most centers would recommend that after two cycles you evaluate the patient and if tumor is regressing satisfactorily more than 30% then you put a, a steel or titanium clip or some material which will stay in that in the epicenter of the tumor and after complete regression you can still locate that clip or marker and go inside during surgery and remove some tissue about 2 cm around that epicenter whether it's clip or some other piece so we did a simple study where we put the tip of the nasogastric tube rice tube you know rice tube nasogastric tube so just 1 cm tip of number 10 french or 12 french nasogastric tube was taken and under local anesthesia we just inserted that in front of the tumor to allow us to identify where the epicenter of that tumor was and when the entire tumor had vanished then we would go in you can easily feel the tip of the the catheter uh, now we are using silicon catheter silicon you know urinary catheter and um, because silicon has is inert and it can be left in body for a long period of time without any reaction so you can easily feel tip of the catheter and it is nicely seen on ultrasound also 
clips are not seen on ultrasound. It's very difficult sometimes. Even a professor of radiology cannot locate the clip and you have to take her to the mammogram machine and so on. And it is never palpable. So it's much easier to put a, just a tip of a silicone or a catheter and keep it there. Um, and when the lady comes after six cycles, then you ask her and discuss if um, she is desirous and tumor has regressed, then you can offer breast conservation and remove to about two centimeter of tissue around that clip or tip of the tube. Okay. So that's a very simple method of breast conservation following complete res response, complete regression achieved by pre-operative neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Okay. And so, okay, so complete remission, surgery after discussion in the multidisciplinary team again and jointly with patients and their relatives, a spouse, and if they are desirous, then offer breast conservation, otherwise mastectomy, okay? And then if there is a residual tumor inside the specimen of the mastectomy or lumpectomy, then you have to give some more chemotherapy and if it is ERPR positive, then hormone therapy. If it is HER2 positive, then trastuzumab. And other targeted agents can also be offered depending on the final histology. And uh, there is a histological system of evaluating the response. It is called Miller Pain. M I W L E R. Miller Pain. P A Y N E. Miller Pain uh, classification of response to chemotherapy. Okay. However, if there is no response, after two cycles, tumor has uh, is static or even progressed from the original size. This is the time you offer surgery. We offer surgery at this stage, but some centers use second line chemotherapy and even third line chemotherapy. But that is a bit of gamble here. Second line chemotherapy are more toxic and more expensive in our setup. And uh, suppose even second line drugs do not work. What will you do then? Then you have, then you will operate, and then you will give third line chemotherapy in the adjuvant setup, which are very, very, very expensive and not easily available, and toxic also, like gemcitabine, carboplatin, etc. So we have this approach: assess after two cycles, no response or static disease, operate, and then. Uh, offer adjuvant therapy in the form of second line chemotherapy. Second line is used as adjuvant. And then for the end, please note that all patients with locally advanced breast cancer, that is more than 5 cm size, node positivity, skin involvement, chest wall involvement, will, after surgery, will receive radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is mandatory after surgery and chemotherapy in ladies who have locally advanced breast cancer. These are indications, even after mastectomy. If you have more than 5 centimeter tumor, skin involvement, chest wall involvement, lymph node involvement, these are indications for radiotherapy. And radiotherapy has to be loco-regional radiotherapy. Loco-regional radiotherapy. Okay? So, breast conservation sometimes can be offered if it is a, a tumor has regressed completely and skin is not skin is not involved. Okay? In general, if the skin is involved, Podarange is there, satellite nodules are there, it is safer to perform full conventional mastectomy, removing the tumor with 2 cm of normal skin around it, nipple areola complex, axillary tail, pectoralis minor, may be removed or just retracted depending on whether it is infiltrated by the lymph nodes in the axilla or not. Pectolis major will be removed at least in part where the tumor is adherent or infiltrating the pectolis major. Okay, Full pectolis major removal as was done in Halstead radical mastectomy is not needed. Okay, But if tumor is adherent or just abutting, sitting on the pectolis major, it's prudent, it's wise to remove the a sliver, just a layer of pectoralis major. And if you are feeling, when you are lifting the breast from the pectoralis major, then you just take the muscle with it. Otherwise, you take a separate layer 
and send it as a specimen right down in the path form deep muscle margin black silk suture and blue ink away from tumor so there are two surfaces so say, suppose this is the deep muscle margin okay one is towards the tumor other is away from tumor so you put some ink and a suture on the opposite side and write down deep muscle margin ink and blue ink and suture away from tumor this will allow you to know whether muscle is infiltrated and if it is infiltrated whether infiltration is going through and through if it is going through and through the tumor is going from the tumor side across to the other side of the pectoral smudger you will have to take this lady back to operation theater and remove full width of the pectoralis major and maybe take underlying pectoralis minor as well if it has gone through and through the pectoralis major but in majority of cases with the pre op imaging you would know this and we always use ultrasound uh, machine in the operation theater and we ascertain whether the deep margin is closed or not and take the deep muscle margin okay it's 1830 now um the you if there are diffuse microcalcification we should avoid avoid breast conservation so that's a contraindication an inflammatory carcinoma we never do breast conservation and if you have done lumpectomy once margin is positive you take cavity shave of that margin report comes back again margin is positive two times cavity shave or margin shave are positive that's an indication that there is some diffuse intra memory carcinoma process going on usually in the form of dcis in situ cancer and that is an indication for full mastectomy so margin positive after two times you did lumpectomy margin is positive take her back to theater shave that cavity again margin positive you better do a full mastectomy because this two times margin positivity is an indication that there is diffuse carcinoma process going on which was missed which was missed by pre operative mammogram and pre operative imaging okay and palpation and palpation so these are microscopic cells which are infiltrating into the tissues or maybe multicentric disease cancerization of the duct and cancerization of the lobule okay but you should be careful and you should be cognizant of the fact that breast recurrence inside the same breast after surgery which is called ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence or in breast tumor recurrence in breast ibtr in breast tumor recurrence or ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence are higher are higher this ibtr in breast tumor recurrence are higher in patients who have advanced disease n2 or n3 disease n3 means internal memory supraclavicular or infraclavicular supraclavicular infraclavicular or internal memory with axillary this call n3 uh, and uh, more than two uh, dr dhatwan yes sir is that right internal memory along with uh, along with the axillary node positive yes, will also become n3 it na? is 3b yes 3b Three, okay. And if we are considering P N three, then it is more than uh, ten or more nodes. Ten or more nodes. Acha count of the node is also included in the latest eighth edition of P N yes. pathological nodal staging. Pathological staging, which was not counted before in the previous previous seventh edition of A J C C classification. We were not counting the number of nodes involved, but in the A J C C eighth edition, we know that greater the nodal burden. Great, more advanced the diseases and worse the prognosis. And in general, ten or more nodes positivity is called heavy nodal burden, heavy axillary nodal burden, right? Heavy nodal burden, yes. and in general they respond poorly to therapy. Therefore, some oncologists will will consider a very aggressive type of very toxic form of chemotherapy for heavy nodal burden disease. as opposed to just one or two uh, nodes right um, so mm, and there is increased risk if there is residual tumor you have offered uh, four to six cycles of chemotherapy and when you do mastectomy 
or lumpectomy, you find that residual tumor is still greater than 2 cm in the diameter, largest, largest diameter. So, this residual disease again indicates there are chemo resistant cells within the tumor and they have not completely been killed by the pre op therapy. So, again, some oncologists believe that these ladies should be given more chemotherapy after their surgery or after their radiotherapy. And many centers are using oral metronomic, oral capacitabine, which is pro drug for. 5 fluorouracil, which is called capacitabine. It's called pro drug. It is not the actual fluoro 5 fluorouracil, 5 FU. It is the pro drug. So, inside the yes, cells, there is some enzyme um, which releases the active drug into the um, tumor. Okay. Capacitabine. Capacitabine. Some program is working where what I am saying, capacitabine, it has transcribed on the screen. <laughs> and presence of lymphovascular invasion, uh, lymphovascular emboli, again indicates that tumor cells have gone beyond the primary breast into the lymphatics, into the blood vessels, and who knows, they have gone to lungs, liver, brain, and bone by way of hematogenesis spread. Again, that is an indication for more aggressive form of treatment, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, okay. Um, now, so the treatment of axilla. So, in axilla, uh, there has been a, a trial called Sentina trial and it was carried out in America and they found that they took the patients who had locally advanced breast carcinoma and then they offered pre-op neoadjuvant chemotherapy and if they were clinically node negative, they performed a sentinel node biopsy also. Okay. If it was negative, then they avoided any surgery. surgery. However, if the sentinel node biopsy was positive, then they did second sentinel node biopsy after the chemotherapy was over. So that was a unique trial design. It's called Sentina trial. Um, assessment of the axilla after radio adjoint chemotherapy. And if they are clinically not positive, then they performed um, chemotherapy. But uh, when they were taking biopsy of the node, they put a, uh, some clip and they make sure that during the removal of the uh, sentinel node, you must remove that clip node by putting a wire or some other guide uh, India Inc. or some other. So it is a, again American College of Surgeons Oncology Group, American College of Surgeons Oncology Group trial, the Sentinel trial, biopsy confirmed node positive disease, they underwent sentinel node biopsy and x-ray dissection after neurogen chemotherapy. But they found that uh, sentinel node biopsy after chemotherapy has a very high failure rate and neg false negative rate up to 30% one third of all. So that's high false negative rate. And this along with our own personal experience, we have now stopped doing sentinel node biopsy in locally advanced breast cancer, T3, T4, and 2 disease. And we just give chemotherapy. And then during surgery, we do level one dissection because we have seen some very bad recurrences. And when we, one year later, when we, during follow up, we found that Initial sentinel node biopsy was negative. One year later, the lady came with axillary nodes, and when we were trying to remove these nodes, we could not. The entire axilla was plastered like a block of cement, and uh, in uh, you know, so therefore, we now offer at least level one clearance in patients who have locally advanced T3, T4 tumor or N3 and 4 disease. So that's about. Uh, so, uh, so uh, just to recap, so locally advanced. When lady comes to you first, you don't know whether it has spread to other parts of the body or not. Okay, so at that time you can only say it is advanced breast cancer. 
arrange biopsy and metastatic workup if pet ct is available arrange pet ct otherwise contrast ct chest or abdomen and pelvis along with isotope bone scan if isotope bone scan is not available readily then a skeletal survey so bone scan plus ct chest abdomen and pelvis is the minimal metastatic workup required and you can add other tests depending on the symptoms lady has recent onset headache or some focal neurological deficits then surely or blurring of vision and you arrange uh, ophthalmologic consultation and you find papilledema please do arrange a ct scan or mri of the head to rule out any brain metastasis so other areas will be scanned depending on the symptoms recent onset bone aches and pains joint disc liver enlargement so you uh, evaluate that organ by a special focused imaging and appropriate biopsy or aspiration but otherwise contrast ct chest abdomen and pelvis along with bone scan is the minimal metastatic workup required for ladies undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy why we need this metastatic workup even if they are not palpable or visible studies have shown that if tumor is more than 5 cm in size or t4 or large node mass or met, uh, symptoms of say recent onset bone aches and pains jaundice majority of them will demonstrate some metastatic focus in some part of the body if you do a metastatic work therefore it is recommended to carry out this metastatic work in early breast cancer one and 2 cm tumor even t2 tumors node negative the positivity of metastatic workup is very low okay therefore you do not waste your time and resources in workup in those patients okay so basically definition is more than 5 cm tumor more than 5 cm tumor okay t3 or t4 a chest wall extension or t4 b skin ulceration satellite nodule or podarange infamous noma will be called t4 d and fixed nodes okay or internal memory chain on ct or clinically apparent or infraclavicular nodes or supraclavicular nodes so this is the definition of and um, concept is that disease has advanced both in the chest this is advanced both in the chest wall or and or lo local regional basin but it is not yet fully metastatic when we say fully metastatic we mean that there is no macro metastasis please uh, remember that the current generation of it's the ct chest with abdomen pelvis can only can only demonstrate macro metastasis they cannot demonstrate micro metastasis and therefore we assume that they are there because if you even after treatment about 50% of these patients will die due to metastatic disease so it is assumed that this those metastatic set, um, cells are present in a microscopic form hence the term micro metastasis okay and they have in spite of all the treatment they have high relapse 40 to 50% relapse and death in the tune of 40 to 50% depending on the type especially if it's triple negative so you arrange triple negative you know this uh, work up right let's plus sampling and assess the menopausal status um, why do we assess menopausal status in the management protocol only because if she is definitely post menopausal you can offer her and it is er positive tumor hormone positive tumor you can offer her an estrazole or letrozole the aromatase inhibitors whereas if she is pre menopausal or you are doubt with you are in doubt whether it is perimenopausal period or not you use tamoxifen 
in premenopausal ladies where ovaries are functioning and secreting significant amount of estrogen and progesterone anestrozole and uh, eximestane letrozole do not work they work only when the ovaries have undergone atrophy or ovaries have been removed from the body by removed by oophorectomy surgery or by radiation oophorectomy radiation therapists can also perform radiation oophorectomy but surgical oophorectomy is more effective and less side effects we can do under laparoscopic you know because ovaries in this age after 30 plus 40 are atrophic anyway and you can do a lap oophorectomy uh, so why it is important and suppose uh, you know the mean of the menstrual history is not very clear so we had a lady day before yesterday and she said uh, she came yesterday so i mean uh, day before so that is uh, beginning of april and she said i had my last period she is 54 and her last period uh, she said i had just some spotting in january so the last period in january just some spotting and she is 54 so how will you decide whether to give anestrozole or to give tamoxifen any any guess doctor so we have to do a hormone profile to see her lh fsh levels estrogen and inhibin levels and to know whether she is actually uh, postmenopausal or not yeah so you ascertain her biochemical menopause okay whether ovaries have truly undergone total atrophy and stop functioning or not can be ascertained by lh and fsh levels lh and fsh and maybe estrogen also no if lh fsh are in the post menopausal range do we still need uh, estrogen level estradiol level in the blood perhaps not but uh, we can discuss with the um, with the uh, gynecologist so they are in the exam they may often ask you know how do you define Uh, postmenopausal status what is perimenopausal period so there are varying definitions among different gynecologists and so most commonly held definition is like this that no uh, bleeding in the last one year in the last one year that is called postmenopausal period and less than one year is considered perimenopausal period and in this period you do uh, serum lh and fsh estimation and if in their they are in the range of postmenopausal you can give anestrozole and letrozole why we are um, uh, you know trying so much to ascertain whether she has indeed achieved chemical menopause because studies have shown even meta analysis have shown that compared to tamoxifen anestrozole and letrozole the aromatase inhibitor drugs have slightly better action in terms of control of the disease so the local recurrence uh, reduced by 3% so 3% less recurrence with aromatase inhibitors compared to tamoxifen however there is no difference in the survival so do not insist on giving aromatase inhibitor because there is no survival benefit compared to tamoxifen okay so if lady cannot afford or your hospital cannot provide free anestrozole don't insist on it and uh, survival will remain the same whether you offer tamoxifen 70 mg daily uh, or uh, for 5 years if node negative disease and 10 years for node positive disease or advanced disease uh, tamoxifen has same survival as the aromatase inhibitors okay so, but otherwise you assess menopausal status so mammogram and breast conservation breast conservation i have just said that uh, you can offer in selective cases of ladies desirous put a clip um, and then um, identify that area by a wire or uh, we these days we inject hematoma we inject patients 10 ml blood into the site where the clip or uh, epicenter of the tumor was and then create a palpable hematoma a 10 ml patient's own blood with a drop of methylene blue to identify this hematoma from the surgical bleeding which occurs during operation so hematoma guided surgery can be done uh, if you do not have facility for wire insertion okay yes uh, mri selective cases 
uh, especially if it is globular histology, we must arrange MRI. Why? To rule out bilaterality and multicentricity. MRI and in women who have strong family history or genetic mutation carriers, MRI is recommended. So we have all then uh, core biopsy and uh, a lot of uh, um, chemicals or biochemical markers of uh, you know some um, investigational value have been reported in the studies like uh, nuclear grading p53 status ei67 of course is well established now it is a mitotic activity marker it indicates mitosis high ki67 index means high mitotic activity s phase fraction thymidine labeling and uh, there is an interesting protein called lost in inflammatory breast cancer protein in short it libc that's the acronym used lost in inflammatory breast cancer libc protein it's a protein which is probably seen in inflammatory cancer so all these probably are, have uh, you know some investigational or research value but they are not used in the regular clinical practice in evaluating the patient and similarly some in the triple negative group uh, a uh, lot of receptors are being investigated like uh, the androgen receptors death receptor you know uh, pdl1 pdl2 uh, and uh, mm, other markers are under investigational value okay sentinel node again i have said that sentinel trial has suggested that uh, one can have um, sentinel node biopsy but it is safer in locally advanced setup to perform at least limited uh, axillary sampling or level one dissection because most of the nodes happen to pres be present in the level one only okay if the nodes are not palpable and then if you do um, perform lower axillary sampling or level one clearance uh, and then palpate rest of the axilla there are no more nodes then i think you are on safer grounds terra firma and arrange post operative radiotherapy and then further chemotherapy if required okay uh, there are some references to some sentinel node biopsy in locally advanced cancers you can read about it but in general it has high failure rate okay and high main problem is false negativity high false negativity so the pros and cons have been stated you know that sentinel node biopsy aims at removing only the node at the highest probability of involvement and if they are negative then we are reasonably certain that uh, remaining axillary nodes will also be negative please remember please remember this concept was developed for early breast disease sentinel node biopsy was not concept was not developed for advanced cancers it was started um, can anybody tell who uh, who was the first uh, surgeon to have given this uh, concept of sentinel node it, it was not in breast some other organ ha huh, sir wo uh, ca penis ke liye cabana 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 yeah cabana and um, so mr cabana uh, found that uh, there is a node located at the intersection of the superficial infiapigastric vein and superficial pudendal external pudendal vein and infiapigastric at the junction of these two veins he found a node and he called it sentinel node and he was using the radio uh, opaque dye radio opaque dye injected in the um, uh, genital so so he gave the this concept first of all and then somebody uh, did some study on i think parotid tumor and you know second sentinel node term i think was used in parotid tumor and then of course in the breast melanoma dl morton in men so the entire concept was developed for patients who have early cancer of epithelial origin which are likely to metastasize and again the premise was the hypothesis was that if we remove the nodes where disease is only microscopic survival will be better results of treatment will be better then if we allow the nodes to progress to become clinically overt palpable nodes then heavy nodal burden would translate into poor survival poor outcome so that was the whole concept identify the nodes at greater greatest chance of involvement 
remove them. If they harbor cancer cells, then do full regional nodal dissection. Otherwise, leave. It was not developed in advanced cancers. Now, people are translating into advanced cancers and they are meeting high failure rate. And we had our share of failures. So, we have stopped doing uh, sentinel node biopsy for advanced cancer. So, perhaps in Indian setup where uh, you know patients often come with advanced disease, it's not a prudent idea to do sentinel node. Okay. And then there are discussions, you know, in the exam, they may ask you, okay, if you choose to carry out sentinel node biopsy, whether you will do it before commencing chemotherapy or after commencing. Okay. So sentinel node biopsy before or after NSAT. There are pros and cons of each and proponents of each. So if you see significant nodal status understood better at presentation because some of the nodes may become negative later on. Okay. So some people say do it before. Then uh, and medical and radiation oncologists want it before, before treatment so that they can ascertain the type of chemotherapy and uh, other you know radiation field etc prior to chemotherapy okay but uh, um, so this is the advantage of pre okay disadvantage some patients who for positive nodes should have ALND when the nodes have disappeared completely they may only have three or four nodes removed and they may come back with the recurrence in the axilla later on. So, so management requires combined modality approach, surgery, radiotherapy, systemic therapy, and hormonal and other agents. Some of the prognostic factors in advanced disease are whether it is T3 or T4, and uh, it is all related to survival. If there are no lymph nodes, see, the number of nodes are also alter survival. 73% five-year survival with N1 compared to 46. So, it, survival drops. Five-year survival, please remember, it drops to from 73% if it is only one node involved, N1 involved, to 46%. 46% in N2 disease. Okay, N2 means what? Fixed to each other or fixed to surrounding structures like brachial plexus and axillary vessels or, mus or muscle. So survival does drop from 73% to 46%, whether they have N1 disease, mobile fixed mobile node or fixed nodes. Tumor size, of course, has this uh, effect. And now we have many um, uh, evaluate scores, you know, which can tell you the probability of survival and probability of recurrence and uh, like predict there's a program developed by cambridge university um, by dr r nipal shatam's group worked on it and uh, you can uh, log on to uh, this uh, evaluation program uh, nhs predict and then feed the values the patient age comorbidity tumor size node positivity etc and uh, erpr status and then you can assess uh, their survival with particular therapy or not. Okay, all these are thiamine index, etc., are of a poor prognostic indicator. And in every case of advanced disease, we must assess the HER2 new status, the nuclear grade, P53 positivity, because they translate into shorter survival. Okay. And Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is also called primary chemotherapy by some uh, people, some authors, or pre-op chemotherapy, or also called induction chemotherapy. These are various names. Uh, induction chemotherapy was the term initially uh, introduced in uh, lymph leukemias. In leukemia, uh, you know, uh, they will give chemotherapy till the last cell counts in leukemia used to go down, and then patient will remain in less uh, remission with the Leukocyte count will be in normal range. So it was called induction chemotherapy. So same term can be used here. Now rationale is that we have these cells which have high nodal micrometastasis. So we will regress them prior to starting any local therapy. So advantages, the putative benefits of 
new adjuvant chemotherapy are listed here. Early initiation of systemic therapy, uh, it is said that once you handle the tumor or even biopsy, tumor cells may disseminate. So we started with systemic therapy first. The chances of dissemination by surgery are redis, lessened. Okay, are lessened. Then uh, if the tumor is intact, okay, and all the blood vessels, you know, in advanced tumor, more than two millimeter size, they have neoangiogenesis. So the blood vessels are intact and whatever drug you give intravenously will reach the tumor through these blood vessels. So delivery of the drugs in intact tumor vasculature is certainly better compared to a situation where you have removed the tumor and there is a lot of fibrosis after healing and those fibrotic scar tissue do not deliver the drugs appropriately and the stem cells left inside the scar may cause recurrence later on. So that's this is one reason why we offer new adjuvant chemotherapy or these days even radiotherapy is being considered and some center, Sloan, Cat uh, the um, Royal Marsden Hospital in London, the Cancer Hospital in London and uh, Milan Institute in Italy, European Institute of Milan, they are conducting studies on new adjuvant It's 19 hours. Because new adjuvant radiotherapy is being um, considered with the same premise that when you have intact vasculature, the oxygenation of the tumor cell is better. And well oxygenated tumor cells respond better to radiotherapy. Okay? Hypoxic cells do not respond to radiotherapy. Hypoxic cells, hypoxic tumors are usually considered radio resistant. So, uh, in new adjuvant radiotherapy is being given because vasculature is intact, tumor hypoxia, tumor is well oxygenated and therefore more sensitive to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Okay, chemotherapy offers an in vivo assessment. You can tailor the response to therapy. You measure after each cycle with caliper and with ultrasound um, or breast imaging. You can assess the response. Once you have removed the tumor, like initial mastectomy, initial lumpectomy, then your adjuvant therapy is like a gamble. It's like a gamble because you know, in studies have shown that only 5%, only 5% patients benefit from, pre, uh, from adjuvant chemotherapy, only 5%. So in 95% patients, the adjuvant therapy only causes, only causes what? Undue toxicity. Toxicity, um, you know, ulcers in the mouth, diarrhea, mucositis, loss of weight, and bone marrow suppression, hair loss, alopecia, you know, no ladies like alopecia. And they, they make a hole in the pocket of either the husband or the exchequer of India, right? It's a waste, you know? So mm -hmm. studies have shown that only 5% patients benefit in terms of improvement in survival and recurrence reduction with adjuvant. So in 95% it goes waste. That's why we have now um, so many uh, scores to assess who will benefit in the form of Oncotype DX, MAMA print and other genetic uh, uh, you know, signatures to tell whether a particular patient is at high risk for metastasis, then you offer chemotherapy, otherwise you prefer chemotherapy. That's the whole rationale. So, if you have in vivo response assessment, so much the better, okay, prior to starting any. So he, here we know whether tumor is chemo resistant or chemo sensitive. If drug A doesn't work in the pre-op session, then you offer surgery and the post-op period, you offer some other drugs, not the same drugs, okay. So in adjuvant setup, you do say mastectomy or lumpectomy, and then you arrange six cycles of CAF or CEF or doxycycline epirubicin. And three years later, she has a recurrence. Then you say, sorry, ma'am, we tried to give you chemotherapy to kill the microscopic uh, mi micrometastasis as we read in David Tass book or Monica Morrow's book. But drugs have not worked. We are sorry. So it is like a gamble. Only 5% patient will really benefit with adjuvant. And that is the whole idea that new adjuvant therapy 
is becoming more and more popular, not only in locally advanced, but also in early disease, also in early disease, okay? Because it offers in vivo assessment for the response. And if drug A doesn't work, use drug B. In army, they have a rule that uh, they make two or three plans, you know? If enemy comes from this side, the plan B is there, you attack from this side. If they have, you know, uh, uh, encircled you from two sides, then what to do? So they keep two or three plans, plan A, B, and C. So similarly, if plan A, that is new adjuvant therapy, has not worked, then you use some other drugs. Don't use the same drugs because they are also going to fail. And yes, studies have shown that soon after surgery, surgery, major surgery, along with general anesthesia, is immunosuppressive state. Trauma, surgery, major burns, major septicemia, uh, pain, uh, and general anesthesia, GA, inhalation, inhalational general anesthetic agents, they all cause immunosuppression. Suppression of the cell-mediated immunity as well as humor immunity. But in tumor control, we require mostly cell-mediated immune response based on cytotoxic uh, CD8 cells and NK cells. Okay, CD8. And after surgery and GA, there is increase in Treg cells. Treg are bad cells. T regulatory cells um, should be low and CD8 should be high to render effective immunological control of cancer cells. Okay, so soon after surgery, there is suppression of that cellular immunity and as a result, cells can grow during that period. And some studies have shown that if you offer anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, like etorolac, NSAIDs, in the perioperative period, you can reduce that growth spurt of cancer cells because pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, IL-17, and TNF-alpha, they all are increased in this period, post-surgical period, and they tend to allow the cancer cells to grow. And if you suppress it by ibuprofen, ketorolac, other NSAIDs, then you may suppress this. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy, again, aims at reducing that post-surgical growth spurt. You might have heard of a proletan trial of uh, Professor uh, Budway and Dr. Vani Parmar in uh, Tata Memorial Center in Bombay. And uh, they offer one dose of medroxyprogesterone in the... Mm, progesterone injection had uh, as 500 milligram one dose and uh, then operate within uh, 7 to 14 days after surgery and they have found 10% reduction in recurrence and death by one dose. So again, idea is to suppress that post-surgical growth spurt by changing the hormonal milieu. So, um, okay. Uh, so this is, these are the option down staging. Some people use the word downsizing. You never stage. Stage remains the same, um, but uh, downsizing the primary tumor as well as node metastasis. Therefore, you can do less radical local regional surgery. Surgery will maybe less radical, but radiotherapy will be still local regional. Local regional radiotherapy includes the radiation on the supraclavicular neck area, above the clavicle, internal memory chain, whole breast chest wall and axillary chain, axilla. Uh, some people will avoid radiotherapy to axilla if you have done full axillary dissection because combination of radiotherapy to axilla along with full axillary lymph node dissection, level one, two and three, combination of radiotherapy and full dissection increases the chance of lymphedema to a very high level, okay? Therefore, you should not irradiate the axilla which has been fully dissected. But if there are perinodal spread, soft tissue deposit in the axillary biopsy specimen, then you may have to give post-op radiotherapy. Okay? And new adjuvant chemotherapy certainly, certainly offers the option, offers the choice of breast conservation if the lady desires it. Okay? What are the limitations of neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Some believe that it may induce 
some kind of drug resistance and um, you can never measure the true size of the tumor it was 10 by 10 on mammogram or some imaging right but it may regress to only 2 by 2 or zero in complete pathological remission last week i saw a report of a lady where the clinical size was 2.5 mammography said 2.7 and based on 2.7 we performed wide local excision but you know the histology report histology said it is 55 millimeter tumor 55 is more than 5 centimeter so it is t1 t2 t3 what is this stage 55 millimeter tumor largest dimension t3 sorry T3. 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 Very good. So if we knew the original size of actual size T3, we would have offered her divergent tumor therapy. Okay. You don't operate 55 millimeter tumor. Uh, you know, you offer chemotherapy. But we did not know. The pre-op size reported on the imaging was 2.7. So based on. So sometimes there can be discordance between the uh, imaging size and the clinical size. So, this is one uh, problem with offering chemotherapy. If we had offered her chemotherapy uh, first, uh, that 55 millimeter we never knew and would have regressed, but her original uh, prognosis, original prognosis would be determined by that original size of 55 millimeter, isn't it? Okay. Right. And we will, uh, we would have lost that original size. Now, if you put her data now in any uh, predict uh, another, you know, uh, uh, prognostic marker, you will put 55 millimeter as her size, tumor size. And otherwise, what you would have done? You would have put 27 or something uh, in the pre-op imaging. So this is one uh, reason why some people tend to operate first. If this, they classify locally advanced into operable and inoperable. And they say that uh, there is no survival benefit of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. All the trials, which were uh, quite, uh, you know, from today's standard, quite historical, they were conducted about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, NSABP B18 and B27. These are two trials carried out in America. NSABP 17 and NSABP 18 and 27. So NSABP 18 uh, took large operable tumors up to 4 cm in size and half were offered surgery first, mastectomy or breast conservation and other half were treated by 4 cycles of AC, adriamycin, cyclophosphamide and then surgery. And they demonstrated that about 13% patients achieved complete pathological remission, PCR, by preoperative neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Then second trial was launched by NSABP, it's called NSABP 27, in which they added taxane, docetaxel, four injections uh, at 100 milligram per meter square. Um, so AC four cycle, then docetaxel four cycle, and then surgery. This was one arm. Other arm, AC4 cycle, surgery, and then docetaxel. Third arm, AC and surgery. No taxane. So addition of taxane in NSAP BB27 improved the PCR, pathological complete remission, from 13% to exactly double. Double of 13 is how much? 26%. 26%. Exactly double. Okay. So, uh, you improve the pathological remission to double if you add taxane. Um, and studies have shown that if you have, so you should remember something about NSAP B18 and 27 because in the exam they may ask. Uh, so it, then somebody did a meta analysis of all these trials, Mori et al., and um, they took nine trials of neoadjuvant therapy and found that there was no survival benefit in these women who had received new adjuvant compared to adjuvant. There was reduction in breast mastectomy. Okay, so breast conservation was increased in new adjuvant therapy, but no reduction in survival. 
no reduction in death rate. So uh, this is in nutshell. That's why some people say if tumor is operable, you better operate. You give the, all the pathological details to the pathologist, uh, you know, size, etc., grade, and then do the rest at the end. Because till now there is no survival benefit proven. But in a subset of patients, in a subset of patients who have achieved complete PCR, now the data is emerging that yes, they have better survival and less recurrence. So how will you know whether this lady is going to uh, achieve PCR by giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy? So I mean, it's a you know, twisted argument, but uh, in general, most oncologists now believe that we should offer neoadjuvant chemotherapy to all locally advanced cancers, more than five centimeter, at skin involvement, chest wall involvement, nodal involvement, uh, also to triple negative disease, also to HER positive disease, also to women below 50. So regardless of the tumor size or nodal parameter, they will offer neoadjuvant chemotherapy to any tumor, aggressive histology, and age below 50, pre-op therapy. So these are the some of the arguments. I think I'll stop here. And uh, uh, these are various trials where they have shown that uh, up to a complete pathological response of 30 and clinical response of 49% can be achieved with a pre-op chemotherapy. And it varies in different uh, trials. So, uh, but uh, there is no difference in survival. Please note that there is no difference in survival with neoadjuvant chemotherapy compared to adjuvant. Okay, no difference in survival. And most people will use docetaxel and epirubicin. Taxanes have improved the uh, survival. And you can read some of these papers, NSPB 27 trial data and trastuzumab again has been added on a new adjuvant setup if tumor is expressing HER3+. If it is HER2+, then we arrange FISH test. What is the full form of FISH? Fluorescent in situ hybridization. Fluorescent in situ hybridization. Okay, hello? Hello, sir. Are we still connected? No? Okay. And adjuvant hormone therapy is also used, especially in elderly lady. They come on a wheelchair, they have severe heart disease, and or some stroke. They cannot walk. Their general performance status is 50 percent. You know, KPS Karnofsky performance score is 50 or 40. So chemotherapists usually say, no, no, she has high risk. She will develop toxicity, which may even be fatal. So you can give tamoxifen to them or anastrozole to them and so it is called neoadjuvant hormone therapy. Neoadjuvant hormone therapy of course you have to assess the ERPR status. It will be effective only in ERPR positive tumors not yet. Okay so there are many drugs. Tamoxifen will be effective both in premenopause as well as postmenopause. That's the beauty of tamoxifen. Effective in all age groups, all menopausal status and Whereas L, uh, the anestrozole like drugs will be effective only in the mostly in the postmenopausal. Post right? Because once uh, as long as ovaries are functioning and they are secreting significant amount of estrogen and progesterone, uh, these drugs uh, aromatase inhibitors will not exhibit their anti estrogen suppression because they do not work on ovaries. They block the enzyme aromatase and aromatase converts uh, the hormone 17 hydroxydiapoindrosterone conversion into 17 beta estradiol and conversion of hydroxyapoindrosterone into estrone. So at two levels, it uh, formation of E3 and formation of E2. E2. Right? Mm. Yes. Uh, they are blocked by aromatase uh, inhibitors. So, but it does not work in the ovaries. So, ovarian estrogen continues to be secreted. 
if you if you give pre uh, this uh, aromatase inhibitors. But tamoxifen works differently. It blocks the receptors. A selective estrogen receptor modulator, SERM, is the acronym for tamoxifen, reloxifen, or meloxifen, which is the Indian anti-estrogen NDSERM molecule. SC, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulator. And LHRA, you can convert a lady from premenopausal or perimenopausal period to postmenopausal and then give her an estrozole. Because a study has shown 3% regre uh, regre regression or reduction in the recurrence with uh, aromatase inhibitors compared to tamoxifen. So, some people argue, oncologists argue, that if we if we offer her, so she is premenopausal, perimenopausal, right? So you give LHRH, LHRH analog will block the secretion of LH and RH, LH, uh, um, LH and FSH from their anti epidutary gonadotrop cells. So it causes chemical hypophysectomy. It also blocks the receptors of LH and FSH on the ovaries. So chemical oophorectomy. Okay, so then you have con by blocking the LHR F FSH uh, secretion and ovarian function, you have achieved chemical hypophysectomy and chemical oophorectomy. So she is converted into postmenopausal. Biochemically, she becomes postmenopausal lady, right? And then you can give uh, aromatase inhibitor. But uh, you should remember in our setup. Um, these drugs are very expensive. There is an Indian LHRH analog, which is called Lupride, L-U-P-R-I-D-E, Lupride, 3.75 milligram. Uh, it costs 3,000 rupees. It has to be given deep intramuscular once every month, as long as she is receiving this drug, right? So if you are putting her on five years of um, uh, this drug, um, if she is, say, 35, till she becomes... Uh, biochemically postmenopausal, you will have to continue give LHRH plus the anesthesol. If she's around 50 plus, then you may have to give only for two to three years. And then when she becomes really, her, bio, her chronological um, menopause sets in, then you may have to stop, then just to give anesthesol. But just remember the cost factor uh, of this drugs. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of argument a new adjuvant versus adjuvant and uh, an SABB18 trial was set up just to answer this question B18. Okay, so 1500 women were taken, 750 uh, randomized for adjuvant AC4 cycle, and other half were operated uh, first and then post op. Uh, and they found that uh, overall survival in both groups were 70% at nine years follow up. And disease-free survival for both groups range between 53 to 55. So no survival benefit achieved by an SABP trial. Right. Uh, most uh, authors, you know, initially considered MRM as the traditional standard for LABC. But if you have a lady has achieved significant reduction and she wants um, mass conservation, you can safely perform yeah. the conservation, achieving negative margin. Sentinel node is questionable, a viable option if uh, there are no palpable nodes and uh, there were no palpable node even the beginning, then certainly we can use sentinel node biopsy. But if there are palpable large nodes in the beginning, then it is a bit risky and has high failure. Okay, so different uh, authors have offered you know breast conservation by different means, but if tumor is a small, you can do breast conservation, otherwise. It's prudent to do mastectomy, okay? And you should have negative margins. That means no tumor on the inked edge. No tumor on the inked edge of the specimen. That is called negative margin, okay? So I think criteria for selection of breast conservation after chemotherapy, of course, it should be patient's own will and absence of multicentric disease as ascertained by post-chemo mammogram. So always arrange a post-chemo mammogram. Make sure that there is no multicentric disease by, in the form of diffuse microcalcification. Diffuse microcalcification is due to 
usually calcification inside the ducts, diffuse ductal disease inside two or invasive microcalcification indicates ductal carcinoma. Right, lobular carcinoma does not have microcalcification usually, and usually there should be no skin involvement. So T4 T4B is usually a contraindication to breast conservation. Please remember this. Most authors uh, or most examiners in your exam would like to hear that if you have a skin involvement, avoid breast conservation. And it makes sense. The skin involvement in the form of podarange uh, and if you satellite nodule indicate that there is a retrograde lymphatic spread. Retrograde lymphatic spread, tumor emboli have traveled in the reverse direction into the skin, subdermal lymphatic plexus, and they have blocked the lymphatic. That's why you have podarange and the tumor cells have grown uh, along the lymphatic, subdermal lymphatic in the form of nodules. So presence of a skin nodule and diffuse podarange is usually a contraindication to breast conservation. Inflammatory carcinoma, big no, 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 no. Never breast conservation, never sentinel node biopsy, and never breast reconstruction. Right? Three things, no, no, no. Always chemo metastatic workup, chemotherapy, followed by full mastectomy, no role of breast conservation, no role of uh, sentinel node biopsy, and no role of uh, breast reconstruction also. Because they say, in spite of full treatment, uh, tumor will come back. So why waste resources and why, you know, so no breast reconstruction is also done. Okay. So I think I'll stop here. Radiotherapy, it's in the form of local regional radiotherapy. Conventionally, uh, we have learned that uh, uh, chemo uh, radiotherapy should be done, given to patients who have more than 5 cm of tumor or who have more than 4 nodes. Now, there was some doubt what to do for ladies who have 1 to 3 nodes positive. So, there is a trial going on. It's called Supremo trial and uh, uh, run by Edinburgh University in Scotland. In, uh, but uh, and the results of that Supremo trial are not mature yet. We're still waiting. By 2023, 20, 20, they will publish the results. So till that time, we are giving radiotherapy to all patients who have even one node positivity based on the Oxford overview, where they demonstrated that there is definite survival benefit and reduction in local regional recurrence if post-operative, post-mastectomy radiotherapy is given in the presence of nodal metastasis. So we have a single node involvement, we give radiotherapy. Some centers uh, give radiotherapy after mastectomy only if four or more nodes are involved. Okay? And, but uh, arterial uh, radiotherapy definitely improves the local regional control as well as survival. 20% reduction in mortality odds. Right? Because it is thought that the local recurrence acts as a seedling for further spread into lungs, liver, brain, and bone. So by reducing the local recurrence in the breast, in the chest wall area, you are actually diminishing the odds or probability of recurrence elsewhere. So because these recurrent nodules act as a seedling, secondary seedling for more metastasis. So suppose tumor had remained confined to the breast and to the axilla. On the initial of treatment, you offered breast conservation or mastectomy and there is a recurrence. That initially, there was no spread. But two years later, when that recurrence occurs, recurrence is usually due to more resistant clone of cancer cells, cancer stem cells, which are resistant to initial treatment. Then they grow. Because this is arising from a more resistant clone of cells, this acts as a seedling for further metastasis. So if you reduce the chance of local recurrence, you will reduce the chance of systemic recurrence. So that's the premise on which radiotherapy has actually been shown to improve survival. You will think how local treatment will improve survival, but it does. Okay. So therefore, we should offer radiotherapy even if one node is involved. Now, uh, you should just know the principles. 
that it, loco regional radiotherapy supra clavicular field uh, and uh, um, internal memory chain and if you have done full axillary dissection you should avoid uh, radiotherapy due to the axilla if for full dissection undergoing full ALND you should avoid uh, axillary radiotherapy otherwise there is a high chance of lymphedema of the upper limb so preclavicular field irradiation should be offered in advanced motor disease okay so adjuvant hormone therapy can be offered in the form of uh, scrm selective estrogen receptor modulator drugs tamoxifen raloxifen and uh, they all offer they can be used both as neoadjuvant and adjuvant. Tamoxifen, well validated, NSBB 14 trial, 24 trial, reduce recurrence and reduce the 50% chance of contralateral breast cancer. You know, 50% reduction in contralateral breast cancer is also achieved by tamoxifen. And among high risk ladies, ladies who have high risk for breast cancer due to family history, high risk lesion like. Atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, labular carcinoma in situ, they're all called high risk lesions or diffuse papillary lesion, high risk lesions. So, in women with high risk lesions or high genetic mutation carriers, it's 1930. Family history of breast and ovarian cancer, other cancers, and or presence of BRCA1 mutation, BRCA2 mutation, P53 mutation, ATM gene. P10 gene, you know, and Gardner syndrome, all those can have significant reduction of their cancer occurrence by five years of tamoxifen, 20 milligram daily. Okay, so it prevents the occurrence of cancer. All at least ER positive tumors are reduced. We can also offer letrozole and estrozole in the form of adjuvant hormone therapy if they are postmenopausal. Okay. So just to summarize, workup, initial workup, assess all the receptors, ER, PR, HER, metastatic workup, bone scan, and then docetaxel, epirubicin, um, respond, partial or complete response. If there's complete response, you can offer BCS, otherwise, mastectomy and um, after completing six cycles. And then external radiotherapy, local regional radiotherapy to chest wall, axilla, supraclavicular region. And continue hormone therapy if it is ERPR positive. You can convert her premenopausal women uh, by bilateral lapophorectomy, converted to postmenopausal, and then given aromatase inhibitor. Otherwise, tamoxifen. She doesn't respond to chemotherapy alternate second line or or mastectomy or mastectomy okay and in follow up every three monthly uh, for five years and then yearly uh, for next five years and if they become very old and enfeebled uh, leave the follow up for their local general practitioners and tell them to arrange at least once a year mammogram and mammogram only has been found to be really useful uh, test in the follow of ladies who have breast cancer. Okay, other tests like ultrasound liver, alkaline phosphates, chest X-ray, bone scan—they all have not been found to be of any use during the routine follow up of patients operated for breast cancer. Only one test has been found to be useful. That is yearly mammogram. Okay, mammogram of both breasts if you have conserved the breast, mammogram of only contralateral breast if you have done full mastectomy. Ultrasound, chest x ray, alkaline phosphate, LFT, and other tests have not been demonstrated to be of value unless you have symptoms. If a patient has joint this palpable liver, surely you will do ultrasound, even biopsy of the lesion if it is seen, and full LFT. So, otherwise, a chest x ray if she has dyspnea, you know like COVID-like symptoms these days, surely you will not only have chest X-ray and CT chest. CT chest may be risky. You know, today we were talking of one lady who was COVID positive or suspected COVID and she went in for CT. Now in the 
uh, report came back as positive. Now everybody was, is, uh, you know, uh, spraying the antiseptic hypochlorous acid in that CT machine and disinfecting the whole CT room. So, uh, so I mean, these are problems in the COVID era. And they say that uh, during this COVID pandemic, you should avoid, avoid immunosuppressive chemotherapy because in the immune suppressed state, COVID coronavirus can uh, become aggressive and then may cause problem. So I think uh, I think I'll stop for I think I'll stop here and then take questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Stay safe. Stay free from coronavirus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So if there are no questions, then I'll stop here. Uh -huh. And please make sure that you disconnect immediately. No? Dr. Rajita? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Oh, no. Thank you. Thank Hello. You. Sir. Yes. Yes. Uh, sir. Sir, if the patient comes with T3N1, uh -huh. no B C. Yes. Uh, when is the situation where we'll operate upfront, and when will we try to choose chemotherapy and then operate? Uh, we usually uh, offer chemotherapy first if lady is fit enough. So she will be assessed by a team of oncologists and. Uh, if she is deemed unfit for systemic IV chemotherapy, then we offer oral chemotherapy. We have done some studies that oral 5-FU in the form of capacitabine, oral methotrexate tablet and endoxod tablet, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate and oral 5-FU, that is capacitabine, can be given to these elderly ladies who are deemed unfit for systemic IV chemotherapy. And they have very good response. Forty percent complete pathological remission. So, um, um, you know this argument that patient is not fit for chemo, therefore I will not give chemo is probably not good because when you cut through the skin or breast which is full of tumor cells, you will cause very rapid spread and may cause recurrence in the post-operative period on the chest wall and that recurrence uh, is very aggressive it is like a, a shield like a shield which the um, you know armor you know armor which um, the soldiers uh, used to warriors used to wear like rana pratap that uh, you know that shield kavach kavach you know in hindi they call it kavach like rana pratap used to wear so the whole chest becomes like a kavach, like armor, and it is called cancer on curas. So it's impossible to treat, very distressing, very painful. So that's why that's one reason why we should offer urgent chemotherapy in LAB. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, sir Priyanka, uh -huh. here. sir. Yes, please. Uh, sir, one question to you. So, on follow-up, every woman you suggest uh, uh, yearly USG abdomen to see endometrial thickness? No, 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 nothing, nothing. I said nothing. Only mammogram, only mammogram. All other tests have been found to be useless. No, okay, no ultrasound, no LFT, no alkaline first phase, no chest x-ray. Only clinical examination and yearly mammogram. Clinical examination and mammogram only. If they have symptoms, if they have jaundice, then you do ultrasound. If they have uh, khasi, cough, you know, corona-like symptoms, then you do test actually. And corona okay. test. Nasal yes. of coronavirus. Okay, thank you, sir. All other medications have not been found to be of any use. Any When we say any use, uh, that means uh, you could not predate. You could not predate the detection of metastasis. If he had Say lung metastasis. By the time she had lung metastasis, which was shown on the chest X-ray, it was also manifesting clinically. She had shortness of breath. She could not climb the stairs. And when we put the stethoscope, there was uh, features of neural effusion. Okay. So yes. by doing chest X-ray in asymptomatic lady, you are not detecting. You are not predating 
in order predating the detection of lung cancer. Similarly, by doing lung uh, liver ultrasound, you are not predating the detection of liver cancer. Okay, so that's why it is important to be. Oh, no. So, and one more thing, uh, you said some uh, silicon tube insertion before doing VCS, like uh, when we see patients to find out the location of uh, tumor. So, I just wanted to know about that procedure. Okay, like, so just take about a centimeter tip of a silicon catheter. Okay, yes, sir. after two cycles, if the tumor is regressing, that you know that this tumor is going to regress and may disappear after six cycles. Yes. At that time, just place a small cut with a 15 millimeter, 15 number blade and tear it to the tumor. Put an artery for it. Just make a small tunnel in front of the tumor and then leave the that tip of the catheter in front. So this is the tumor, right? This is the tumor and you insert yes. this catheter and put a stitch so that it doesn't come out. So this tip okay. will stay and when the entire tumor regresses, you will still feel that tip of the caster. You can see it beautifully on the ultrasound and then just remove two centimeters of the tissue around it. As opposed to this, conventional uh, wisdom suggests that you put a steel clip or titanium clip. Clip is not palpable. Clip is not seen on ultrasound. It can only be seen on mammogram. So then uh, they take her to mammogram room. The experienced radiologist, not everybody, experienced radiologist then puts a wire, steel wire, you know, like fish hook wire near that, near that clip. And then the lady is taken immediately to operation theater and we do wire guided excision of the tissue around it. Okay. Okay, sir. Which yes, is expensive. The wire costs uh, around 2000 rupees or so and you need expertise. Uh, you need a special mammogram machine where you can insert that wire. Not all the hospitals have the facility. Whereas, you know, the tip is always palpable. You can feel the tip and you can easily see on the ultrasound and just remove the, you know, so you render impalpable lesion palpable. By placing this tube, we are rendering impalpable lesion palpable. That's it, beauty. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. If the lesion is seen on the post chemo ultrasound, Hmm. On mammogram, you can see the lesion. Okay, yes. there is some residual lesion. Palpable, there is no palpable mass, but on the imaging, you can see the lesion. Then the other option is to inject, take take the lady to imaging room, and if it is seen on ultrasound, well and good. Otherwise, in the mammogram room, and then take a long spinal needle. So what we do on the day of operation, we take her. First in the morning. So we usually schedule a second case on the surgery. Take her to up the radiology room and take two or three spinal needles, long spinal needles. And yes. take a, a 10 ml syringe where we have taken a drop of methylene blue. So just as you know, when you take a, a, a arterial blood gas sample, you uh, they take a syringe and put some heparin, right? Yes, sir. Just, yes, rin just rinse the syringe with heparin, isn't it? So that blood doesn't clot. Similarly, just take a 0.1 ml or 1 ml of methylene blue and rinse the syringe just on the wall. And then yes. take patient's blood, 10 ml of patient's blood. You inject with the spinal needle into the site where the tumor is. So you create a hematoma, which is 10 centimeter, which is fairly big, easily palpable, beautifully seen on ultrasound. And because you have taken a drop of methylene blue, it has a blue, uh, blue so it becomes a uh, royal blue blood, royal blue blood. Okay, in British, yes. you know the the um, monarchy, you know, like uh, king and queen and prince, they are called blue, having blue. They are said to have blue blood. So this becomes blue blood, and you can easily see the blue blood hematoma and distinguish it from the fresh blood which may come from surgery. So you just remove that bluish blood hematoma and do the sonography of that to make sure that the uh, lesion is yes. okay. if there were calcification then you can do mammogram of that uh, mass specimen so a specimen sonography of or a specimen mammography okay, sir. thank you thank you sir, sir uh, good evening sir
Good evening. Good evening. Sir, uh, even after uh, the alternate systemic therapy and uh, if the patient is uh, still non-responsive, then you, sir, mentioned that uh, we should go for, uh, uh, sir, uh, directly for the surgery and then followed by the radiotherapy. So, sir, is there any role of new adjunct radiotherapy in this case? New adjunct radiotherapy, yes. In uh, London, Royal Marsden Hospital and in Milan Institute in Italy, they are doing studies of new adjuvant radiotherapy. And uh, the advantage is that uh, we are offering radiotherapy to well oxygenated, well vascularized tumor tissue. So response is expected to be better. Long term results are not available yet, but theoretically, it sounds uh, superior to giving conventional radiotherapy where it is offered to a scar tissue. In the scar, the tumor cells are embedded within a fibrous scar, which is less vascular, and hypoxic uh, chemo stent tumor cells may not respond to radiotherapy. So that's the advantage of new adjuvant radiotherapy. And yes, in MD Anderson Hospital, they are doing a study where they give pre-op chemotherapy. If tumor has regressed or completely regressed, then they will take biopsy. Several biopsies are taken from that area where the tumor was, okay, and by vacuum-assisted biopsy. And if all the tumor biopsies or tumor bed biopsies are negative, then they assume that chemotherapy has totally killed the tumor. In that case, you give radiotherapy to that area with the hope that remaining cancer stem cells will be killed by radiation and you do not do surgery, just observe, follow up by imaging, MRI or mammogram. And if there is a residual tumor or recurrent tumor, then only surgery is done. So chemotherapy first, then radiotherapy, new adjuvant, hmm. follow up, surgery reserved for recurrent or residual disease only. Thank you, sir. In lymphoma and leukemia, we have seen that um, you can cure them without using knife. Lymphoma. In Hodgkin's disease, you don't use knife, right? Yes. You use chemotherapy with or without radiotherapy for bulky disease. And similarly in leukemias, you don't use your knife. Yes. This is spread, you know. So when such a diffuse disease present throughout the body can be cured without using knife, why not a localized early disease? So that's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Stay corona free. Thank you. Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, this is Vishwak Chandra from SJPGI. Oh, Namaskar. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. So I'm having uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the flipping of the uh, tumor mapping, mm -hmm. uh, as they ex expect the uh, regression of the tumor is patchy regression rather than a uniform regression. Um, after two cycles of chemo, there is a chance of migration of this epicenter. So why can't we do this mapping just before the initiation of new joint chemo so that we could prevent uh, misplacement after uh, two cycles of new joint chemo? Mm, I know Dr. Uh, Gaurav Agrawal um, you know, has this uh, study that where he puts the clips at the margin of the tumors initially prior to initial uh, yeah and then um, then they have studied how the tumor is regressing in all cases it does not regress in a uniform manner sometimes it may be like a, a map of australia or even map of india where you have sri lanka away and uh, andaman nicobar or lakshadweep so tiny islands main tumor may regress so imagine a map of india with all the islands around the main map of india may regress and you think that there is complete remission. But these islands, Nicobar Island, Lakshadweep, uh, Sri Lanka, they are still there. And we don't know. That's, that is the reason of recurrence. So, yes, you are very right. Uh, in all patients, tumors do not regress uniformly in the same, at the same rate in all the... It's not a, it's very, not a absolute sphere, it's patchy, you know, like map Australia or India. And regression may not be uniform. So that is always a possibility that if you put a clip in the center, 
then you may leave these peripheral and Andaman Nicobar and Lakshmi Islands. So that's a possibility. That's why we offer post-operative radiotherapy. We never, in locally advanced cancer, after chemotherapy and breast conservation, we are still, even after mastectomy, we are still giving radiotherapy. Why? See, if tumor was more than 5 cm and you have done full mastectomy, why do we give radiotherapy? You've done full mastectomy, right? No breast tumor is left. Okay? Yes. So, and margins are negative. All margins negative. Tumor was 5.5 centimeter or 6 centimeter. You did full mastectomy. Why do you give radiotherapy for a 6 centimeter? If tumor has gone, why are you giving radiotherapy? Even after full mastectomy. I'm not talking of breast conservation. I'm talking of full mastectomy. We give radiotherapy even after full mastectomy because the studies have shown that there is a recurrence in the skin flaps, in the chest wall, in the rib cage, and in the axilla, and in the neck. If tumors are more than 5 cm, if they are lymphovascular emboli, if there is heavy nodal burden, more than 4 nodes, so we cover them by post operative So same is true for breast conservation. So if they are microscopic cells, we are going to cover them by post operative radiation. Yeah. And after whole breast radiation, you know that they give tumor bed boost. Right? That's why you put Liga clips there. When you have lumpectomy, you put five clips, one posterior and superior, medial, lateral, and inferior. So five titanium clips are placed, and Liga clips are placed at the tumor bed whenever you do breast conservation. Right? So they will then take the lady to CT room for CT guided dose measurement for radiation and under IMRT, intensity moderated radiotherapy or IGRT, they will then irradiate the whole breast and boost to the tumor bed. Boost is given to the clip area. So all this is done with the objective that some cells might have been missed by chemotherapy. So, you know, that argument that you should place the clips at the periphery. You know what will happen? Suppose there was 9 centimeter tumor, 9 by 9. Now you put the clips at the periphery, right? 9 centimeter apart. After chemotherapy, the, the whole thing may shrink. Right? Suppose it becomes 6 by 6, not, right? Because uh, the, after the regression of the tumor, you will put the clip not in the tumor, but in the normal tissue. Wearing chyma outside, isn't it? Right. Yes. So that clip may stay there. So distance between the two clips may still be eight or nine centimeter. Are you going to remove nine by nine? That nine by nine removal is almost equal to mastectomy. I mean, even in a very large breast, if you remove nine by nine tumor, uh, nine by nine tissue, it's almost equal to mastectomy. You will need LD flap or some other flap. Or that. So the, the concept is to reduce the tumor to very small size or to disappear, regress it completely and then offer breast conservation. So that uh, ability to offer breast conservation will be lost if you put the, if you put the clips at the margin. Right? So if you had to do 9 by 10 tumor, why you gave chemotherapy? You just could have operated at the first place. As soon as she came, you did surgery and then did that. So if you had to remove 9 by 9, you might have done you know, surgery afresh as the primary treatment. Thank you, sir. And you should also see the long-term results. The long-term results of most studies where tumor was large, the pre-op therapy given uh, and epicenter of the tumor removed by around the clip, uh, most studies show very low recurrence, right? So that means those microscopic cells uh, are being controlled in majority of patients. And you are keeping close watch. You are uh, in locally advanced cancer, we should have a close follow-up, three monthly checkup for initially two to three years, maybe, you know, usually in early breast cancer, we say three monthly for first two years because most local recurrences occur in 18 to 24 months, up to two years. After two years, if there are no more recurrences in early breast cancer, we say, okay, madam, you come after six monthly interval. 
she completes two more years, so five years have gone. If there are no recurrences in early breast cancer, T1, T2, N0, or early N1, up to five years, you have a reasonable, reasonable certainty that she will not develop any recurrence later. In ER positive tumors, recurrences can occur up to seven years. Up to seven years or even more. In ER negative, especially triple negative tumors, most recurrences will occur in two years. They may be dead in two years. If there are no recurrences up to four or five years, then you can say they are almost cured. So, in aggressive disease like locally advanced breast cancer, perhaps you should continue three monthly checkup for at least five years. And whenever you are in doubt, uh, some nodularity felt, we quickly do ultrasound in the clinic only. And if there is some suspicious area, next day we take her to radiology room and request them to do a mammogram or a high resolution ultrasound or even MRI and then biopsy that area. We have a higher, uh, you know, a low threshold for biopsy. The moment we feel a nodule in the operated breast, or in mastectomy scar, uh, we don't wait. Uh, if the nodule is pretty small, we don't even waste time in FNAC because in a small nodule, needle will slip around that nodule. So we just take her to a minor or major operation theater next day or day after and take out that and confirm um, whether it is cancer. Because some people will say that you should uh, biopsy it. If it is large, then uh, sub suitable for uh, true cut biopsy, core biopsy, yes, biopsy. Because if it is positive, then you should do a PET CT scan to rule out metastasis and then chemotherapy. And you know, you should also do receptor studies second time. Even if tumor was ERPR positive, next time it may become ERPR negative. It may change the receptor status. So recurrent tumor also should have ERPR ATR status. And so metastatic workup and then chemotherapy and then do local surgery. But if there is only a small nodule and it may be just fibrotic scar, then uh, if you do PET in all such cases, you may be giving radiation. PET CT has a lot of radiation, not only of the CT scan, but also of the F18, chloro, chloro 18, you know, is an isotope. So instead of that, for a very tiny, you know, 5 mm nodule in the scar, we just take the two, um, which is not suitable for any needle biopsy. We just put a small cut, remove that from the mastectomy scar or from the uh, you know surface of the skin. And if it is cancer, then sure, metastatic workup and chemotherapy and all. So this is our approach. Um, if there is a recurrence, so you should looking at one cancer, maybe three monthly checkup, continue for longer period. So that you know three monthly for two years and then six monthly for three years was the schedule made for early breast cancer. So if she has advanced disease, maybe three monthly checkup for the first five years. And if any lady develop recurrence, right, in the follow-up, then she should continue one to two monthly checkup because they are more chances of getting further recurrences. So that rule of three monthly for two years and six monthly remaining, right, then yearly later on, is only for early breast cancer, those ladies who remain recurrence free all the way. If they develop recurrence anytime in this uh, you know life cycle of the cancer, then you should have monthly checkup or more frequent. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. How is Dr. Gaurav? Uh, do, are you still locked yes. up in uh, Sanjay Gandhi Institute? Locked up or you are operating? No, sir. Uh, we are fixed on our OT during the emergency. Sir. Only trauma center is open, eh? Trauma center is open. Good, good, good. Thank that you. is fine, sir. Tell you. Say my regards to Dr. Gaurav Agrawal, Dr. S.K. Mishra, Dr. Anjali Mishra, Dr. Amit, and Dr. Sure, Gyan, Dr. Gyan. Right. Sure, sir. Sure. Stay healthy. Sure, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rijuta. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks very much. So, we are switching off now? Yes, sir. Okay. And you can uh, distribute those papers, you know? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Namaskar. So, we'll find out about.